So Fei Fei Li, you are a professor of computer science at Stanford, and you are the chief scientist for AI research at Google Cloud. Uh, Marie Paul Cani, you are a professor of computer science, of computer science at Ecole Polytechnique, and your research area is uh, graphics, computer, computer graphics, and computer vision. Uh, and Gregory Rena, you are the founder and chief AI officer of Xbrain. So we are going to begin with a very simple question. You are all the three representing three different fields of AI. Fei Fei and Marie Paul, you are more on researching on vision and visualization. And Gregory, you are more exploring the natural language processing space. Um, and so I would like to kick off this panel by asking you a very simple question. What is your very own definition of AI? So maybe we, we work this way. Yeah, so um, AI is a field of 60 years old. So I think the very original definition, which is still the dreams of many of us in AI research, is the quest for machine intelligence is making machines that are capable of perceiving, learning, communicating, making decisions and actions. So that would be my definition of AI. Super. As you can imagine, I completely agree with you. And I will just add more because I'm more focused on delivery daily because I'm a startup and a company. Um, I really like to define AI as the industrialization of information. It's globally how you will find any task with a cognitive task and a repetitive task because I'm in the language. Language is more, uh, you know, animals got really the vision. What is very, very particular for us, uh, it's more about language who represent the ID. And it's really the difference between us and other species, language. And it's why I think uh, industrialization, industrialization of information is really maybe a good uh, definition. Okay, Marie-Paul. I agree with this definition. What I'd like to add is that in addition to helping to, to analyze data and to, um, uh, to take decisions, AI can also be used for creative tasks. And this is also a very difficult problem uh, for, for humans. We, if we want to, to make machines help us, they need also to help us for creation. Super. Uh, so beyond the tech aspects of AI, you all mentioned the benefits for humanity. And so, Fei Fei, I, I, I read that you recently insisted on the notion of a human-centered AI. Uh, so can you explain us a bit more what you mean? Yeah, sure. Um, so if you look at the history of AI, I think we have, at this very moment of history, entered a phase two of AI. Phase one of AI is the past five or six decade in which the AI is more or less an academic discipline developed mostly um, in the, the, the computer science and, and mathematical uh, algorithm uh, part of the, the science. But now the technology is much more profound and powerful that the phase two of AI is where AI is beyond the technology itself. So in this new era, we've been thinking about what, how do we define the phase two of AI? What are the most important themes and ingredients? And that's when I call it the human-centered AI um, thinking. And there are three important uh, elements of the human-centered AI. Um, one is that uh, we need to acknowledge AI, AI technology is still nascent. There is a lot to be done. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from the 1970s that define, define what is AI and it's still so true today is the following quote. It says that um, the definition of today's AI is a computer that can make a perfect chess move while the room is on fire. So you can change the word chess to any favorite game you have, but it's still true that AI still today is so narrow. It lacks the flexibility and complexity of holistic understanding and learning that many of the researchers earlier today has mentioned. So the first element of human-centered AI is really push AI to be a lot more complex 
to behave more like human intelligence that is more nuanced and uh, and um, um, you know take into uh, advances of brain science, cognitive science, and, and behavioral science to to make AI technology a lot more um, human-like. The second element of AI, uh, human-centered AI, is about enhancing human, augmenting human, interacting and collaborating with humans instead of replacing humans. These are technology that would um, become very critical and important in the future of jobs, in helping us to improve healthcare, education, sustainability, manufacturing, and many uh, new opportunities. And the third ingredient of human-centered AI is about AI and society, AI and humanity. And you heard a lot about that as well, is that we need to look at AI's impact in ethics, in um, economics, in law, in uh, philosophy, and, and bring those interdisciplinary study and understanding together to assess and understand the, the, the human um, ingredients of AI. So these are the three areas that I would call to define human-centered AI. Thank you so much. In other words, you are promising us an augmented human and an augmented society to a certain extent. So, Gregory, this is also something you are looking at with Xbrain, removing repetitive tasks from the corporate world. I would like to hear you on that. Yeah, exactly. Um, first of all, you need to understand the name Xbrain. Uh, a small X, a big brain, a big B for uh, the human brain. Um, with my partner, Pierre Noël Luigi here, we are really thinking about how we can augment people with AI. It's really, we are clearly in the area of the augmented people. And you know, any people joining our company need to have this core value to work on AI technology, on natural language. And we deployed inside of customer services, call centers, a system we really try to, put the, to, to use and to put the human at the core of the technology and all the design thinking of our product is, is created from that. The, the, the agent from the call center is no more an agent, is becoming a pilot of the AI, is in control. You are providing the control on the AI uh, for the human. And if you are thinking, as we just um, see uh, regarding the definition, uh, we are no more that industrial guy of information. It's industrialization. At the end of the day, it's the human at the core. And it's the human who is piloting the machine. And it's how we provide system for call centers to deploy completely. Uh, the good effect is about the productivity. It changes everything because we can arrive at 100% of accuracy because we can work with the human and the machine. When the machine cannot continue to answer, we are switching to the human. And the human can take the control on the machine at any time to provide an incredible user experience and completely reinvent the relationship between the brain and the customer. Thank you. Marie-Paul, in your field of research, you are also exploring the help of AI in creative tasks, as you mentioned. So uh, beyond classification, decision making, can you talk to us about it a bit? OK. I'm also working on the idea of augmenting humans. Ah, and for me, w what makes sense to life uh, is, in fact, that uh, in addition to taking care of each other, what can mean, make, make sense is to, that we want to understand the world around, around us and we want to be able to create new things. And for these two, these two activities, we will need the help of uh, being able to visualize our thoughts. We, have, we imagine, imagine scienti scientists who try to, to, uh, to understand the world, they have their own uh, object of study and they have a mental image of this object of study which may be moving, deforming, it may be a cell, it may be, it may be space, it may be whatever the scale. And, they, and if they want to explain this to other people or to refine their thoughts, uh, do they have other tools right now than paper and pen? 
uh, could we use AI to help the scientists ex uh, uh, refining and expressing their object of study? And for engineers, it's even more, more stronger. In any industry, if you invent a new mechanism, if you invent a new object, you need to, to model it. You need to model it in 3D before fabricating it. You need to test your virtual prototype. And right now, from, your, from the rough image you have first in your brain to this virtual prototype, you have to pass through a long, long, long series of steps with uh, uh, non-smart computers. Could we use AI to help to this creative task? Um, yeah. so this is, this is um, even more prospective than, than we could uh, expect and even more engaging. And actually, I would like to be even one step beyond in prospective. So I think you have a, 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 a video, uh, Marie-Paul, but I would like that ev every one of you share with us one exciting example, very concrete one, uh, on, on AI. So maybe we start with you and then... And then yeah, we, we can show the video. Uh, uh, this video is because this area is new. Uh, uh, if you want to have humans creating, they can create through sculpting. But could they sculpt object by, by, while giving constraint to a computer. Here you are sculpting a castle, and whatever the gesture you've ma you're making, this object remains a castle. If you're, if you're pasting together three walls, the tower will become a round tower. If you're cutting, you have towers appearing. So uh, you can sculpt in a few gestures a medieval city from the knowledge of what is a castle. So this is an, an example of using AI. If I want now to copy paste a garment to another character with a different morphology, if I'm not, uh, uh, if I put knowledge in the model, then I can directly copy paste and have the garment automatically smartly adapt to the new morphology while keeping all these characteristics. And here an example we, that we developed with biologists is if, if I want to model a tree and I want in a few gestures to be able to model the image I have of this tree, the tree is multi-resolution, is also self-similar, but if we input in the model mon uh, knowledge from the biology and we take uh, statistics on the, on the little bumps the user was drawing, in a few gestures, we, you, you are able to model this complex object. Here, the, the, so we are really modeling for rough examples, small data given by the user. Here, the user has drawn trees on flat areas and stone on slopes. If you learn this with a statistical model, then you can move your little forest and the trees will always remain on flat areas and the stone will always go on slopes. And if you learn from a simulation, here ecosystem simulation of plant growth, then I can provide to the user like a brush and with the brush they can paint reforestation on, in an area destroyed by fires and you can see how this area will look in, a, in, in 10 years, for instance. Another very last example, uh, I cannot draw a mountain, but I can draw maybe the, 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 the rift or the, the edges of the mountain that I, that I would like. And if you do machine learning here, deep, deep, deep learning from the mountain, You'll be, you'll be able to create this because from the real data, you've extracted the sketch, you've learned this example. So in my area, when we use deep learning, we generate our own examples. And after that, you increase the creative power of humans. Really impressive. Fei Fei? So you want us to give an example of human-centered AI. And uh, one of the most salient example comes to my mind is a five-year-long collaboration I've been doing at Stanford uh, with the School of Medicine at Stanford with uh, my um, doctor colleagues. Uh, we recognized since five years ago that um, in our, you heard from Ran, that our medical system healthcare uh, needs a lot of uh, um, reformation and, and uh, there's a lot of opportunity for technology to come and, and uh, 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 make this whole system better. And uh, in the heart of healthcare, there is a very, very important part of that is the care delivery. Not only is about reading x-rays and, and, and hospital records, but about the human interaction in healthcare delivery process, for example, uh, surgeons operating on patients, families taking care of aging seniors, doctors 
uh, and nurses taking care of inpatient hospital uh, uh, patients or patients sitting in emergency department waiting to be seen. So all these healthcare scenario are called a uh, care delivery scenario. And this process has two major issues. One is that, as you have seen from Ron's talk, that any medical error could be uh, causing damages or even death to our patients. So any error, human error introduced, is highly risky and um, profound. Um, second is it could be very in inefficient, which drives up healthcare costs sky high to many, many countries. So when we look at this issue in healthcare, we suddenly, it dawned on us that AI technology has a role to play here, not to replace our doctors, but to help to make the whole care delivery process more intelligent, to give more information to doctors, or to help remind them in critical, critical steps of surgery or care process. And this is very similar to self-driving cars. What does a self-driving car do? A self-driving car uses modern sensors to sense the environment, the behaviors of other cars, pedestrians, and other objects in the environment. And then it collects the data, sends it to algorithms that can make intelligent perception and understanding of the environment, and then deliver back actions, sometimes it's an action that the car does by itself, sometimes could be a reminder to a driver. So we start to do this in Stanford Children's Hospital and worked on a particular project of hand hygiene practice in hospitals. It turned out that is one of the leading causes of patient death in hospitals is hospital acquired infection caused by a lack of hand hygiene practice. And it's very, very hard to track hand hygiene practice. To this day, there's no good technology. So we start using sensors that are installed in hospital uh, rooms and hallways and help our doctor to um, monitor their own hand hygiene practice. I won't get into the technical details. Of course, there's deep learning algorithms involved, there's smart sensor involved. But that's an example that excites me, that uses AI technology in the human environment to collaborate and help humans. Gregory, you have an example in yeah. mind? Yeah. Maybe uh, two elements uh, about augmented human and people-centric. Um, just because we are a startup and there is not a lot of people, uh, deep experts on natural language, we needed the first one to disrupt ourselves. And we augmented our work directly uh, as a natural language guys and scientists. And we decided to automatize a lot of our work. And why now we've got a productivity with far beyond on what we can do as a human. Second one, about my research. Uh, I don't have the time because, uh, as everyone here, we've got a lot of stuff to do. And I decided three years ago to augment myself through technology that I can use, a uh, natural language. And I created an AI who is in charge of my research. Today she's re reading millions and millions of news per day and really focused on my profile and coming back to me with uh, just a list of what is very important for me today. She read everything online coming back to me, and if you are following me on LinkedIn or Twitter, you will understand because I'm sharing the co-working we are doing together. Uh, some people can, uh, many people came back to me and said, Greg, how are you doing? How many people in your team are working with you uh, to do your research? I'm sorry, I'm alone and 30 minutes per day. Super. I improved my productivity on research from 1,000. And I think it's a point which is very important. We are not speaking about time one, two, ten. We are speaking about time 100, 1,000. It's a disrupting approach when you are using AI and deep learning. Super. Very impressive example. Thank you. So beyond the potential, we cannot put aside the, the risk. And so I would like to hear you about the most important risk uh, you perceive in AI. Actually, it's you, Gregory, Yeah, that I would like to hear on, on that. Uh, I think we already spoke a lot about the risk uh, regarding our bias 
people who are using uh, autonomous waypoint, uh, freedom of mind. Uh, globally, today we saw with some last event we, we had online, uh, we need to take care. But more than that, uh, we don't need to be afraid. We need to be positive. Because if we are not positive in France and in Europe, we will freeze the market. We will freeze everything. And during this time, other nations are moving very quickly. And it's not a matter of you or me. It's more a matter of our kids and the future of our nation. We need to move. We need to embrace this technology. We need to be aware about the risk, but take the opportunity. And that's the key point. Can I, can I add to that? I, yes, I and totally you can, agree you, with you. You can I, continue on, I do on the other topic. I do talk about one um, risk or awareness that we heard a lot about the ethical, social, economical um, considerations of AI this morning. And I want to add one other dimension that is not talked a lot today yet, which is the, the crisis of diversity and inclusion in AI technology. Mm -hmm. um, as an educator and a technologist, I wake up every day thinking about the following question. We know AI will change the world, but who will be changing AI? Because, uh, because this is a technology that's meant to transform humanity in the years and decades to come, and we all recognize the gravity of how important this is. So um, uh, yesterday, we also had a sharing with uh, President Macron and, and um, many of the leaders in, in, in France that worldwide, we have a, a very, very low percentage of women and underrepresented minority working in AI as technologists, thinkers, and leaders. And this, um, if you think about diversity and inclusion, I think it actually will bring three very positive things, as uh, Greg was saying, to our society. First is that this is a growing sector of technology and work. And just by economical and labor computation, that we need more labor force to be joining the technology and also leadership and, and, and uh, um, work around AI. So m missing half of the population or a large portion of the population is not a good idea. We need to involve more people. And this is, and this is and the concept of fair AI. Hmm? And uh, to go on your side, uh, on your way, uh, excuse me, uh, I'm one of the members of Roubaix.ai. And we are launching in north of France uh, the first lab to deploy AI for citizens, for people directly. Because we are speaking a lot about industry, uh, university, researchers, and how to maybe make profit with AI. And that's good. And thank you for that. But don't forget that what's high for my mother? What's high for my grandmother or my grandfather? How high will improve their life? Yes. I just think to, it's great. Just to add two more reasons. Yes. yes. Is, uh, the sure. other reason is creativity, is that Every research has shown that when you have a diverse group of team workers working together for a solution, the result is more creative and innovative, and, and you will know a lot more than I do on creativity. So this is really important to, you know, as this technology is so nascent, there's so much work to do, we need that diverse representation. And, and the third and last, which a lot of people talk about, is fairness and justice and our moral responsibility because this technology has a potential to be biased, to be unfair, to be unsafe, that we need to invite uh, the right, the, the, the fair representation of humanity into AI. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm ready to, to reconciliate a bit the, all the points here. We, we've analyzed at McKinsey that there is a direct correlation between diversity and economic performance. So. Uh, maybe Barry Paul, you want to, to I will give I you the word of, uh, a very, of conclusion. Very, yeah, uh, yeah, very, yeah, very short word. Sure. Uh, in fact, the principal risk with AI is that the general public do not understand what AI can do for them. And uh, I, I, I really believe that AI should be used as a helper, not to create in our place, but really to help us take care of constraint and unnecessarily repetitive details, and, 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 and so that we can be augmented humans.
Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you, and uh, for these impressive examples. And uh, I think we're going to switch to the other panel. <laughs>